Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We live in a dangerous world. Issues of national security, the worst pandemic, public health crisis in modern times in America, and we are being challenged as to whether there's going to be a peaceful transition of power in America in the presidency. At that moment in time, we decided none of those topics were important. And what was important was to determine whether or not social media was discriminating against Republicans. It's an interesting question. I think there are more important and timely questions. We have a recount underway in Georgia. We have allegations made by the election officials there where they, the Republican allegations, Republican election officials, where they have faced literally death threats. We are trying to determine whether or not the social media instruments of America are fair to the Republican Party. I'm trying to struggle with this issue because I want to put it in a context, and maybe I can't. Maybe it's, this is unique. We certainly know what the Constitution says when it comes to free speech. And we know what it meant over the years, uh, New York Times versus Sullivan and others with publications. Uh, we certainly didn't suggest that anyone that used a telephone line for nefarious, illegal, banned activity somehow implicated the telephone company in, into it by, by its nature. And then came radio and TV and we had to come up with new rules in terms of at one time, equal time, fair content, and so forth. Uh, and now we have this new, relatively new mechanism of communicating information, and we're trying to determine what to do with it, whether to treat it like a newspaper publishing or treat it like some sort of a communications network alone. Section 230 is an attempt to do that, and I'm sure everybody finds fault with it. I'd like to ask the two witnesses if they would comment on the historical uh, aspects of this particular debate, if they have any thoughts. Mr. Zuckerberg. Senator, one of the, the points in the discussion that, that, that I find interesting is people ask if the regulatory model should be more like uh, kind of the news industry or more like telcos. But from my perspective, these platforms are, are a new industry and should have a, a different regulatory model that is distinct from either of those other two. Um, I think it is not the case that uh, we are like a telco and that there are clearly uh, some categories of content, whether it's terrorism or child exploitation, that people expect us to uh, to, to moderate and and, um, and, and address. Uh, but we're also clearly not like a news publisher in that we don't create the content and we don't choose up front uh, what, we, what we publish. Uh, we give people a voice to be able to publish things. So I, I do think that we have uh, responsibilities and uh, it, it may make sense for there to be liability for some of the content that is on the platform. Um, but I don't think that the analogies to these other industries that have been created previously um, will ever be kind of fully the right way to look at this. I think it deserves and need its own regulatory framework um, to, to get built here. Thank you. Would the other witness care to respond? From a historical perspective, um, 230 has created um, so much goodness and innovation and, uh, you know, if we didn't have those protections when we started Twitter 14 years ago, we could not start. And that's what we're most concerned with is making sure that we continue to enable new companies uh, to contribute to the internet, to contribute to conversation. Um, and we do have to be very careful and thoughtful about changes to 230 because um, going one direction might box out new competitors and new startups um, going another might create a demand for um, an impossible amount of resources to handle it and going yet another might encourage even more um, blocking of voices or 
or what's being uh, raised here, which is uh, censorship of voices and changing so, the internet dramatically. So, so let me, go ahead. So okay. I, I, I believe that we can build upon 230. I think we can um, make sure that we're earning people's trust by encouraging more transparency around content moderation and our process of it. I think we need much more straightforward appeals. And I think the, the biggest point to really focus on going forward is algorithms and how they are managing and creating these experiences and being able to have choice in how to use those algorithms on platforms like ours. Let me get into a specific, um, Mr. Zuckerberg. Uh, October 10th, Depart Detroit Free Press reported 13 men charged Thursday in a conspiracy to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer used Facebook and secure messaging apps to connect and plot their attack. The group's use of Facebook spans almost a full year. Members began to use the social media platform as a recruitment tool in November 2019, according to an affidavit by Brian Russell, De Detective Sergeant, Michigan State Police. Once recruited, members communicated via a secured encrypting message platform. According to news reports, Facebook alerted the FBI about the Michigan kidnappers' online activity several months before the arrest. Thank goodness. However, in August, a Facebook page for the Kenosha Guard Militia, which advocated violence in the aftermath of the shooting of Jacob Blake, was reportedly flagged over 455 times to Facebook. However, the page was deemed non-violating and left up. More than 4,000 people responded to that event. Hundreds of armed militia members showed up. A member of this group, a teenager from Illinois, later shot and killed two people on the streets of Kenosha. Mr. Zuckerberg, you describe Facebook's handling of this militia page as an operational mistake. Can you explain the exact reason why the Kenosha militia page was not taken down? Senator, yes, and, and first, and what happened in Kenosha was was obviously terrible. Um, what what happened here was we rolled out a strengthened policy around militia pages in in general. Um, whereas before that, we would have allowed um, a, a group that was a militia as long as it wasn't planning or organizing violence directly. In the lead up to the election, we. Uh, strengthen the policy to disallow more of those groups because we were on high alert and we're, we're treating this situation as very volatile around potential civil unrest around the election. Um, we just put that policy into place and um, for a number of reasons it had um, not yet been fully rolled out and, and all of the content reviewers um, across the company hadn't been fully trained on that so uh, we made mistakes in assessing um, whether that, that group should be taken down. But upon appeal, when it was escalated to a more senior level of, of, um, of content review folks who have more specific expertise in these areas, um, we recognized that it did violate the policy and we, we took it down. Um, it, w it was a mistake. Um, it's, it, it was certainly an issue and we're, we're debriefing and, and figuring out how we can do better. Although one other piece that I would add is that um, the the uh, uh, person who, who carried out the shootings um, w was not in any way connected to um, that page or linked to, to any of the content there from anything that we or, or others can tell. Mr. Chairman, if I can ask one more question. Uh, yesterday, the FBI released its annual hate crime incident report. The report found that more people were killed in hate-motivated violence in 2019 than any year since the FBI began collecting hate crime data in 1990. The report also found that race-based hate crimes remain the most common type of hate crimes last year and documented increase in religion-based hate crimes, anti-Hispanic hate crimes, and hate crimes targeting individuals based on gender identity. Given these statistics, it appears to me that it's more important than ever for social media companies to combat hate on their platforms. And I might add to one, one of my colleagues who stated earlier, this is not Antifa, but these are documented hate crimes from FBI. Muslim advocates, uh, Muslim have reached out to you many times, Mr. Zuckerberg, about this issue relating to published content uh, 
that reflects on certain religious groups. And you said at a hearing, you do not allow face hate crimes on Facebook. Yet in May 2020, the Tech Transparency Project found more than 100 American white supremacist groups, many of them explicitly anti-Muslim, active on the platform, both on their own group pages, as well as auto-generated content. Facebook did nominally alter some of the content, but the eight groups largely remained. Are you looking the other way, Mr. Zuckerberg, in a potentially dangerous situation? No, Senator. This is incredibly important, and, and we take uh, hate speech as well as incitement of violence extremely seriously. Um, we, we banned more than 250 uh, white supremacist organizations and treat them the same as, as terrorist organizations around the world. And we've ramped up our uh, capacity to identify hate speech and incitement to violence before people even see it on the platforms. Our AI and, and human review teams, um, is you, you can track our results in the transparency reports that we issue, um, now take down about 94% of the hate speech uh, that we find on our platforms before anyone has to even report it to us, um, which is a dramatic amount of progress from where we were a few years ago, um, where when we were just starting to ramp up on this, um, we're, we're taking about 20% of it down before people had to report it to us. So there's still more progress to make. Uh, we're very invested in this, and uh, you have my commitment that, that we view this as uh, the, an issue of the highest severity and one that we are, we are very focused on. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.